everyone to our global webinar. Today, we have amazing topic to discuss. Our topic today is about uncovering asset misappropriations. You know, all these executives, all these managers inside the organizations, they are thinking that you don't have the proper internal controls in place. And wherever they are operating, if they are in the purchasing department, sales, if they are in actually operation, if they are handling uh, you know, payroll, whatever they are doing, they are trying to figure out how can they actually manipulate the internal controls to take advantage by doing corruption, by doing fraud, by manipulating the numbers. And today we have amazing expert, global speaker with us, Mr. Al Ala Abu Nab'a, and he is very well known over social media. He got hundreds of thousands of followers over social media over the last 15 years. And he is going to share with you amazing experience over 15 years of actually being involved in major audits and major investigation. How can you actually, when you are doing your work, figure out the proper red flag to look at, figure out exactly what are the internal controls that you need to have to ensure that this fraud will not happen. And with that, I will give the mic to him. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Mr. Riyad, and thank you, everybody, for attending this uh, session, and I'm very happy to be with you today. Uh, good evening, good morning for everybody, because uh, I, I, what I noticed that uh, people around the world are watching this video. So, uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Ara Bunaba, and I will be your uh, presenter today. Uh, my session will be interactive, so I will ask you a few questions. So please, everybody, enter the chat room and start writing the question number and your answer and look at uh, the other, other answers by other colleagues. So uh, let's go. Um, I have five sections in my presentation. My, the first one is the introduction about the topic. So my first opening question, who is the ultimate responsibility, who, have, who holds the ultimate responsibility for risk management system within the organization. Please write uh, question number one or one and your answer. And look at other colleagues' answers. So many of them, they are saying the board of director is ultimately responsible. Okay, then let's see the second question. My question number two, who holds the ultimate responsibility for the internal control system within the organization? Great. And my third question is, who holds the ultimate responsibility for preventing fraud from occurring? Great. The answer for these three questions are what is known the governing body. Uh, in the governance schools or frameworks, they start calling the board of directors, board of trustees, etc., who are in charge for the governance uh, system, uh, governing body. So the board of directors are the ultimate responsible for the risk management system and the, the internal control system. And part of this control system is the uh, con controls for preventing fraud from occurring, whether the fraud come from in-house or from outside the organization. Okay, my fourth question is, which one of these occupational fraud schemes is the most difficult to detect by normal audit or control procedures? So write question number four and your answer, whether A or B or C or D. The answer for this question I it will be part of my presentation. Let's go to my question number five. If you have to select one control procedure, which one you will select? The control procedure that will reduce the, risk, the fraud risk likelihood or the control procedure that will reduce the fraud risk impact? Which one you will give the priority? A or B? So write question number five and your answer or A or B. You have only to have to select one control. Okay. The, okay. the answer for question number five is the one that reduced the risk likelihood. Okay. So my question number number six, uh, question number six, if you have to select one control procedure, which one, which one you will select? 
the control procedure that will prevent fraud or detect the fraud or correct the fraud? Which one you will give priority? A or B or C? Thank you for your answer. The answer for question number six is A. Yes, I agree with most of you. Okay. The following uh, question number seven. What is the best control to prevent fraud? What is the best control to prevent fraud? Question number seven. Uh, Mr. Warren Buffett, he have a uh, well-known saying. He said, in looking for people to hire, you look for three qualities, energy, intelligence, and integrity. And his saying does not end here. He add to it, and if you don't have the first, the other two will kill you. So the most important control to prevent the fraud is to hire, is the proper selection of people who have integrity. If you look at COSO internal control framework, as you, as you know, COSO internal control framework has five components and have 17 principles. Have five components, three objectives, and have 17 principles. Principle number one in internal control, out of the 17 uh, principles, demonstrates commitment to integrity and ethical values. And this commitment should start from the governing body of the organization. So integrity is the principle number one in internal control. My last question is, what is the best control to detect fraud? So write question number eight and your answer. Uh, please put your answer in the, uh, the sh chat room, not in the Q&A. To detect. If you come out of this presentation of these answers for the, uh, of the for the answers of, the, of these questions, I think you will benefit from this presentation. And the answer for question number eight, as per the uh, ACFE's uh, two th uh, 2020 report to the nations, 43 percent of the fraud schemes were detected by a tip by the hotline. So hotline is the extremely important tool and control to detect fraud. It's better than having an, a strong internal audit function or string, a strong external auditor, etc. Okay, uh, I built my presentation. Uh, most of the statistics I presented in my presentation came from the report to the nation, which recently published by the ACFE. Uh, this uh, report, uh, they studied uh, 2,500 cases from 120 countries around the world. So it's a really big study and represents a lot uh, about the status of the fraud, especially the occupation of fraud worldwide. And uh, in that report, they presented the fraud tree. As you know, the fraud have three main uh, sections, corruption, asset management, uh, asset misappropriation, and financial statement fraud. In my presentation, I will speak about some asset misappropriation fraud schemes, which related to skimming and uh, cash larceny, billing schemes, and payroll schemes. And we cannot cover them all, but I will go just a quick highlight about these four uh, well-known schemes and uh, repetitive schemes. Uh, and considered part of the asset misappropriation. So what is occupational fraud? Who is occupational fraud committed? 
how is the conversion of fraud committed? 86% uh, of the fraud is in asset misappropriation and the median loss for each case is 100,000. And the second, 43% is in corruption. The median loss is 200,000. And 10% are uh, financial statement fraud. And the median loss uh, is $954,000 per case. How often do fraudsters commit more than one type of occupational fraud? The report to the nation answer it. As you can see, asset misappropriation only represents 53% of the cases. Asset misappropriation and corruption represent 26%. Asset misappropriation and financial statement fraud represent 3%. And 5% corruption, asset misappropriation and financial statement fraud is 5%. If we sum them all, it will come with 86% uh, presented in the previous slide. So this is how it come from. What is asset misappropriation? It is a scheme in which an employee steals or misuses the employing organization's resources. Example, theft of company cash, false billing schemes, or inflated expense reports. And these are all types of asset misappropriation. As I told you before, I will speak about skimming, cash larceny, billing schemes, and payroll schemes. In the report to the nation, billing schemes, uh, there were, there were uh, four, uh, 430 cases, represents 20% of all cases, and the median loss was 100,000. Uh, skimming schemes, 230, and it, its percent of the all cases was 11%, uh, and the median loss was 47,000. And then payroll scheme, number of cases was 199 and the percent, percentage was 9% and the median loss was 62,000. Cash larceny, 169, 8% and the median loss is uh, 83,000. Another statistics, another studies shows that more than 28% of business losses from employee thefts ranged from 100,000 to almost half a million, and 25% of losses exceeded 1 million, okay? The median value of cash or goods stolen was uh, placed at 75,000. The source is a statistic brain report. Another study shows that in 2014 alone, more than 1.2 million wayward employees and shoplifters were caught in acts, it's a big amount, in only in the United States. Another study about uh, asset misappropriation by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, 75% of employees have admitted stealing from their employer at least once, and half of them admit to stealing from employers at least twice. And the study covers uh, not uh, more than 4,000 employees in the United States. It's a big percentage, as you can see. About 33% of business businesses, especially medium size, small and medium-sized organizations and businesses, hit with employee theft were pushed into bankruptcy due to losses from theft or fraud. Okay, how do occupational fraud schemes vary by organization size? As you can see, especially the small organization with less than 100 employees, 30% uh, of the fraud were in billing, 17% were in payroll, 15% were in skimming, and 13% was in cash larceny. As you can see, it's double, almost double the organization with more than 100 employees for billing and almost uh, more than two, uh, 200% more than the organization uh, for payroll scheme is skims. And the skimming is the same also. As you can see, small and medium-sized organizations are suffer more from these type of fraud schemes. How long do occupational fraud schemes last? As per the ECP's last report, 
uh, in payroll schemes fraud, it lasts an average for two years almost. Billing schemes for two years also. Cash larceny for 21 months and skimming for 16 months. And all are more than the technical fraud case, uh, other frauds, which usually uh, last for 14 months before detection. Another question uh, answered by the report, what is the typical median loss per month of different occupational fraud schemes? For billing, 4.2 thousand, cash larceny, 4 thousand, skimming, 2.9 thousand, and payroll, 2.6 thousand. And uh, in the entire fraud cases, the typical fraud case causes a loss of 8.3 thousand per month. What are the most common occupational fraud schemes in various industries? If we look at various industries, uh, in banking and financial services, there was 364 cases. 8% of them were in billing. 10% was in cash larceny, 2% in payroll, and 10% in skimming. While, uh, as you can see in healthcare, there was 145 cases, 33 percent of these cases were in billing, billing schemes. And if we look at education, education, for example, there were 82 cases in the report and 30 percent of them were in billing and 22 percent were in skimming. Uh, if we look, for example, uh, service, professional services, there was uh, 54 cases and 37 percent of them was in billing, zero in cash larceny, 22 in payroll, and then skimming was 11 percent. What are the most common occupational fraud schemes in high risk departments? There are the departments that ha have more risky than other departments. So operation is number one. There was 288 cases and the uh, billing schemes was representing 15 percent, cash loss 25 percent, uh, payroll 8 percent, and skimming 9 percent. Accounting 277 case, and as you can see, it's in red. So 32% uh, fraud cases was in billing, 14% in cash larceny, 21% in payroll, and 19% in skimming, and etc. If we go to administrati administrative support functions, there was 116 cases, and 31% was in billing. As you can see, billing is always uh, by department and by uh, industry is more than other uh, fraud schemes, uh, etc. So let's go to skimming. What is a skimming? According to ACFE's uh, 2020 report to the nation, they define the skimming scheme as a scheme in which an incoming payment is stolen from an organization before it is recorded on the organization box and records. Here are a few examples of uh, skimming. Uh, collecting cash, but not recording the sale. Collecting cash, keeping a portion of the cash, and uh, under-reporting the sale amount. Collecting customer's payment, but not crediting the amount to the customer's account. All the, and the last one, collecting cash and holding it in a personal interest-bearing account before depositing it into the company account. All these cases, they call it the direct theft. The fraudster hides cash from into the employer, business, partner, or shareholders. Okay, another example of skimming, which is happening a lot, uh, tax evasion skimming. It is a popular scheme for tax evasion. The owner of a business can pocket cash without recording it in the accounting system. In this case, cash is transferred from the customer directly to the owner's uh, business. Thus, the owner can avoid paying either business or personal income tax on that amount. Okay. The skimming is also known as off-book fraud because the cash is stolen before it is entered into the bookkeeping. That's why it is very difficult to detect detected because there is no direct audit trail that can be followed to, uh, to the source. How to prevent the skimming? 
uh, here's some examples of how to prevent skimming. Uh, the accounts receivable bookkeeper should be restricted from preparing the bank deposit, collecting cash from customers, accessing the cash receipts, accessing the accounts receivable records, and accessing bank and customer statements. Having different employees perform these tasks helps, min helps in minimizing the potential for the concealment of the theft. Another control to prevent skimming, vouchers for credits, credit and sales receipts should contain a serial number. Uh, company mail should be opened by someone other than bookkeepers, cashiers, or other accounting employees who make journal entries. So segregation of the duties is extremely important control to prevent skimming scheme. Another control to prevent the skimming, the employee who, open, who opens incoming checks should immediately stamp all incoming checks with the company's restrictive endorsement to protect against unintended parties cashing the checks. Also, a list of all checks and cash received should be prepared and reconciled daily against the bank deposit receipt and the, ca and the cash receipts report. Uh, the person who opens the mail should deliver all checks and cash to the person responsible for the daily bank deposit. Uh, an employee should perform an independent verification to the bank deposit. Okay, uh, the, he's, here is a list of uh, other uh, controls that can be used to prevent skimming. A copy of the presentation will be sent to all the attendees. Here is a list of controls to uncover skimming. Uh, first one, periodic analytical review of sales accounts using vertical, horizontal, and ratio analysis can highlight the, the discrepancies that point to skimming. Uh, periodic review of the inventory and receiving records using statistical sampling can highlight discrepancies also. Periodic review of the inventory and receiving records using trend analysis can highlight discrepancies. Periodic review of the inventory and receiving records using physical inventory counts can highlight the discrepancies. Uh, here is another list to uncover skimming. Periodic review of the inventory and receiving records using verification of shipping and uh, requisition documents can highlight discrepancies. Inventory accounts should be reviewed periodically for write-offs, accounts receivable and allowance. For uncollectable accounts should be uh, reviewed periodically for write-offs of accounts receivable. Cash accounts should be view, re reviewed periodically for irregular entries. Uh, let's go to cash larceny. Cash larceny is a scheme in which the incoming payment is stolen from the organization after it has been recorded, okay? So skimming before recording, cash larceny after recording on the organization's books and records. Here is a few examples of cash larceny. Stealing cash at the point of sale or register. Stealing cash receipts posted to sales and receivable journals. Stealing cash from bank deposits. Here is another example for cash larceny for cash registers scheme, a false refund schemes, uh, which occur when an employee, number one, issues a refund for fictitious merchandise and keeps the money, or two, overstates the amount of merchandise returned and skims the uh, excess money. Another example, false void schemes, which occur when a register worker retains a customer receipt um, uh, processes fictitious voided sales and keeps the money. How to prevent cash larceny? An employee other than the register worker should be responsible for preparing register count sheets and agreeing them to register tab total. Again, segregation of duties. Access to register registers or cash box should be closely monitored and access codes should be kept secure, not to share with the other colleagues. Customer complaints regarding short changes, short change or improper posting should be handled by someone other than the employee who receives the cash. 
registered workers should be properly supervised by on-duty supervisors or by cameras recording the register activity. Here is a list of uh, other uh, controls that can prevent cash larceny. And here another control also can be used. Actually, the control list is uh, very long, so I selected a few of them. Okay, how to uncover cash larceny? Reconciling cash register tape totals to the amount in the cash drawer. Any discrepancies should be investigated. Monitoring cameras and digital recorders in register area. Reviewing re uh, receivable transaction for legitimacy and supporting documentation. Now we go to billing schemes. In billing schemes, it's defined by AC, uh, the Association for Certified, Certified Fraud Examiner as a fraudulent disbursement scheme in which a person causes their employer to issue a payment by submitting invoices for fictitious goods or services, inflated invoices, or invoices for personal purchases. Here are some examples of uh, purchasing and billing schemes. Shell company schemes, which occur when an employee submits invoices for payment for, for a fictitious company controlled by the employee or a friend of the employee. Pay and return schemes, which occur when an employee arranges for overpayment of a vendor invoice and pockets the overpayment amount when it is returned to the company by the vendor. There is another, uh, another scheme, personal purchase schemes, which occur when an employee submits invoice for personal purchases to the company for payment or when an employee uses company credit card for personal purchases. How to prevent these kind of schemes? The organization should have a purchasing department that is separate from the payment function. The purchasing department should be independent of the accounting, receiving, and shipping departments. Management should approve all purchase requisitions. Purchase orders should specify a description of item, items, uh, quantities, prices, and dates. Purchase orders form should be pre-numbered and accounted for. Okay. Companies should require competitive bids for all purchases, especially when it exceeds X amount of dollars. Receiving department should prepare uh, receiving reports for all items received and should maintain a log, a log for all items received. Copies of receiving reports should be furnished to the accounting and purchasing department. And there are other control procedures, as you can see. How to uncover purchasing and billing schemes? Reviewing master vendor file for unusual vendors and addresses. Analyzing vendor purchases for abnormal levels. Implementing control methods to check for duplicate invoices and purchase order numbers. Reviewing credit cards statement for irregularities. By the way, if the vendor address match employee address also, this can be a red flag uh, for this kind of schemes. Verifying all vendors with post office addresses. Now we go to the last one, payroll scheme. Payroll scheme is a fraudulent disbursement scheme in which an employee causes their employer to issue payment a payment by making false claims for compensation. And as you can see in the fraud tree, and there's three uh, frequent uh, payroll schemes, which is ghost employee, falsified wages, and commission scheme. Here are examples of payroll schemes. Ghost employees, which has happened a lot, especially in governmental sector, and uh, organization that have uh, different location. So uh, in ghost employee schemes, which occur when a person not employed by the company is on the payroll. Uh, let me share with you a video about, uh, about this kind of scheme.
Other examples of payroll scheme, overpayment schemes, which occur when a company pays an employee based on falsified hours or rates. Uh, commission schemes, which occur when the amount of sales made or the rate commission is uh, fraudulently inflated. How to prevent uh, payroll schemes? Personal records should be maintained independently of payroll and timekeeping functions. Uh, again, segregation of duties, sick leave, vacations, and holidays should be reviewed for compliance with company policy. Employees should complete and sign appropriate forms for uh, to authorize payroll deductions and withholding exemptions. And payroll should be periodically compared with personal records for terminations to ensure that terminated employees have been removed from the payroll. And payroll checks should be pre-numbered and issued in sequential order. Uh, the, payroll, the payroll bank account should be reconciled by an employee who is not involved in preparing the payroll checks. P payroll register should be reconciled to general ledger control accounts. Access to payroll check stock and signature stamp should be restricted. And uh, there are many other controls to prevent this kind of scheme. How to uncover payroll schemes? Checking the employee payroll list for duplicate or missing social security numbers that may indicate a ghost employee or overlapping payments to uh, current employee, employees. Performing uh, reference checks to all new hires. 
to make sure that they really join the company, examining cancel checks and uh, for alterations and endorsement, examining payroll checks to the, uh, that do not have withholding for tax, taxes, insurance, etc., and other control procedures. My last slide, perpetrators behavioral red flags. There's some, uh, these are all red flags for all types of frauds, but not all of them applies to these kind of schemes that I uh, explained before. Uh, uh, during my tenure, I noticed that billing schemes, skimming schemes, payroll schemes, and cash larceny schemes, the behavioral red flags, is the most common ones are living beyond means, uh, financial difficulties, uh, unusual close association with customer, and control issues, unwilling to share duties, uh, wheeler dealer attitude, divorce or family problems, complain uh, about uh, the, their pay, always they complain about their pay, about their compensation, and refusal to take vacation. These kind of schemes, uh, these are the most common uh, behavioral red flags for the protesters. Thank you very much for being with us in this presentation, and I'm ready for the, uh, your questions, Mr. Ayad. All right, thank you very much uh, for uh, your uh, presentation. And I think we have some questions from the audience. Some audience, they are asking about, you know, ghost employee schemes. Do you have any, uh, any uh, uh, scenarios that you have experienced based on your experience? I remember uh, one case I uncovered. I was working in a construction company and we have some construction projects in the desert. So I read about the ghost employees schemes. So I decided to visit one uh, far uh, project. Okay, uh, a sudden surprise visit, no, uh, unscheduled visit to see if there is any ghost employees in our uh, project area. And I, I br br brought with me a list of all the employees that should be in that area, that project. When I went there, I just did the quick head count. I noticed only 25% of the employees are there in the location. Okay, so this, this case has always happened, especially in construction company, in governmental sector, and the organization that have a big number of employees. Yes, of course, payroll fraud is, is a big issue, especially, you know, when you see exactly currently in Corona, what's happening, some organizations, they say they, they actually uh, uh, fired so many employees. So there is a recent case happened in one organization where the HR managers, he fired, you know, more than 50% of the employees, but he kept them on the payroll and he collected the salary. And the organization was wondering why the expense is so high, even we fired these employees. So they say, maybe we need to fire more. So you can see what's happening, you know, with the, you know, this payroll fraud. And uh, one case is very interesting happened uh, in the Middle East where one lady, she was actually going and moving the payments for the salaries for the employees that left the organization to her account by changing their uh, IBAN in the system. Then the only way for this organization to discover the fraud that the bank contacted the organization saying, who is this lady that her salary is uh, you know, in millions? So sometimes you, know, you can see exactly all these payroll fraud and this, what can happen. This kind of uh, fraud has always happened with leverage that the companies that depends on labor or people who get wages, not salary. They usually uh, high, uh, put ghost employees to cash their salary, uh, their wages. Exactly. Now, one of the things that you, you, they always speak about are uh, you know, the secret doors inside the organization. So some of the delegates, they were asking, with these schemes, uh, especially related to billing, what can you see, you know, things happening related to corruption, related to billing and related to payment? Again, again, I did not get what, that. What can, what can, from your experience, have you experienced any cases related to corruption and related to bribery when you are speaking about billing and contracting? Of course, uh, especially when there is a collusion between uh, multiple employees, more than one employee, you can't see this kind of case, uh, this incidents. Another question, based on your experience, uh, uh, what, what do you see, you know, the most 
common things happening inside the organization? Is it larceny, is it scheming, or is it you know, fraudulent disbursement? Uh, to be to, uh, frank with you, all of them, all of them, especially when there is a crisis, economical crisis, you can see everything. And it's, just, uh, uh, it's increasing very fast. So all of them you can see with no exception at all. And I, I think the fraud committed by top management will be more. All right, good. That will bring us to the next questions. Uh, one delegate, they are saying, do you know, can you see now a fraud is happening more by top management and senior executive compared to, to before? And do you know what kind of um, uh, schemes they are doing out of all the schemes that you mentioned in your presentation? Uh, actually, top management do, don't, do, don't do these kind of schemes. They do more than that. Uh, top management more, mostly involved in uh, corruption and especially in conflict of interest. Uh, these kind of schemes are usually for uh, normal employees, uh, n n uh, medium level employees, but not for the top management. Top management do, do usually do different type of fraud. All right, another question is interesting saying, do you think we should mandate that organizations, especially in the Middle East, have you know, a hotline, whistleblowing line to ensure that all these violations are being reported properly? Uh, yes, I think uh, using uh, the hotline in the Middle East, especially, is not well known. It's, it's, uh, some organizations started. Uh, the culture of reporting uh, 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 fraud indicators is not there. We need to educate people to report, to report uh, these kind of whatever they see, and we need to give them support. A lot of people see a wrong thing, wrongdoing, but they cannot report it. I remember a uh, transparency organization uh, reported that uh, more than 60% of Middle East uh, people, they see fraud and they cannot report. And when they were asked why, because they, are, uh, they have fear from being uh, hit, uh, 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 because of fear, they don't report whatever they see. So All right. we, we, need, we need to support them uh, by regulation to protect uh, with the whistleblowers. Thank you very much. Another question is speaking about the issue that today we can see it happening more often, especially related to the labor uh, uh, schemes that you mentioned, that you know what will happen uh, that uh, the labor will be asked to give their money back. So there is an incident happened in one country in the Middle East where the supervisor told the labor the government introduced the new tax which is you know income tax and in that way the laborers will get their salary and then after they get their salary and they withdraw it using their card he will be standing by and he, they are giving him 10 percent of their salary and they are thinking that they have to pay income tax from uh, from it because they don't have a system to take it out of their salary so yeah. do you see these schemes happening yes yes especially in construction companies yes when they when yeah. they have a lot of laborers uneducated laborers unskilled laborers this kind of schemes can happen easily. Yeah, I heard about uh, another case where, you know, they were actually uh, trying to, uh, to, they did something interesting where they charged the, the uh, actual government entity double the amount by saying that these labors are working double shift. And then yeah. they discovered that these labors are not working double shift, so. Yeah. Overstating the overtime is frequently happening, yes. All right, another question here. Someone is asking, what is the difference between skimming and counterfeiting? Are they the same? Mm, I leave the answer for you, Mr. Yad. Okay, so uh, and, and, you know, I, I think the person who is speaking, he's speaking about skimming, thinking that skimming is like skimming credit cards. We are speaking here about different kind of skimming. We are speaking about someone will steal the money before entering the organization. So we are not speaking about issues related to skimming and counterfeiting cards. We are saying someone can take the money from the organization before entering the organization, which is uh, I always explain to my students is like when you when you get a cappuccino on top, there is there is all this you know foam. So someone will take it out. So in that way, in Arabic we call it qasut. So yahud al ustah. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, this is how uh, it will happen. Okay, and let's see another question. Uh, what, is, uh, what type of schemes that happen usually in family-owned business and what kind of controls they need to have? 
family owned business. Uh, I did a lot of projects related to corporate governance for family businesses. And I noticed the conflict of interest. Conflict of interest is, happens a lot in uh, family business. Somebody from the family opened the business and did not disclose it to the other family member. And he starts dealing, uh, doing business with this uh, company that he opened, Shell Company. Yes, I agree with you. Do you know, like, it's so funny. One of my friends, he was sending me a case. He's working in the fraud department. And someone reported to the hotline that the son of the owner, and the owner, he's the dad, and the son is actually the CEO. The owner, he's the chairman. So the, the son is actually, was actually creating a supplier company, and the supplier is actually doing the business directly with the organization. So one guy discovered that, and he reported to the hotline, and then the case came to him. So he went and he conducted the investigation and he discovered, yes, the company is owned by actually the son, the CEO. So he reported to the chairman. He told him, listen, you know, th th there is a conflict of interest and your son didn't disclose. Then the chairman, he says, so what? It's my son. So what if he's the supplier? He said, but he's charging us double the market value. Hey, they said, it's okay. He's my son. He can take the money. So sometimes, you know, we can see these cases happening, especially in family-owned business or uh, when we have full control over the operation. So when you have full control over the operation, sometimes you can actually uh, uh, cause all these issues. We, you can see it with the uh, uh, MNC group uh, in uh, uh, UAE when you know, they, they found other construction companies that they are doing the hospitals for the N N MNC group owned by you know, individuals who are related to the CEO and the chairman. So in that case, there's a conflict of interest existing always when we have certain group controlling in a private equity. The, the biggest dilemma in the world wide is conflict of interest. If, if people ask me why governance uh, laws came on recently, my answer is because of conflict of interest. So what's the benefit of corporate governance? Uh, it's just to uh, prevent from conflict of interest. Conflict of interest, they call it the mother of all fraud. Okay, so someone says, so what is the solution for conflict of interest? What can we do to, to, uh, to, to deal with it inside the organization? Uh, not all conflict of interest are uh, not okay. Some of them are okay, but if you disclose it properly and you get the approval from the top management, not disclosing your conflict of interest, this is the problem. Hiding this kind of information. It's okay, you can, usually you go to the general assembly and say, ask their permission to deal with one of your companies or one of your uh, family member companies, etc. It's okay to have conflict of interest, but you have to disclose it. The problem when you don't disclose it. So uh, what you can do, uh, I think uh, this is why corporate governance, we need corporate governance code implemented in the company and we need to have a proper leadership. Proper leadership is the most important control. I told you, I, I think, during my experience, control number one is the proper selection of the employees. And the most important people you need to proper select is the top management. And the most important trait that you need to look at the top management is integrity. Integrity is number one. It's more important than the competency of the leader. That's why one of the best definitions of uh, corporate governance is ethical leadership. And if you go to any uh, the top uh, internal control frameworks, you'll find principle number one, integrity and ethics. If you go to COSO, ERM, for example, or uh, risk management frameworks, you'll find ethics. If you go to uh, governance frameworks, you'll find ethics. Ethics is the most important. And the most important ethics uh, is integrity and the integrity of the top management. This is the most important. If you have proper selection of the top management, believe me, everything will be easy. Yeah, I completely agree with you. You know, culture today in our world, they say culture can eat strategy for breakfast. So if you don't have the proper culture inside the organization where individuals are doing things in the right way, actually uh, a fraud will be happening. They say also, you know, integrity is important to have when you are criminal, they say there is a, a code of ethics between criminals. But sometimes when someone will break the code of ethics between criminals, we will uncover the fraud. You know, like what happened in uh, one hotels in uh, UAE, 
So in one hotel in, in UAE, someone was able to figure a way uh, how to steal the money from the valet parking. So what will happen? Usually when you go to valet parking, you have to give them the ticket, right? So in that way, you will give them the ticket, you get your car. So he understood, understood the process. So he did something very smart. When you come, he will give you a ticket and he will write, you know, your card, he will write, you know, your card number on the ticket, but he is actually using a, a transparent ink. So in that way, what will happen, this ticket will be linked between your car and between, and, uh, you know, you, but you have the number that can match with the card and he actually writing with transparent ink so the ink will disappear later, but actually the keys is there and linked with the, with the code of the ticket. When you come back requesting your, your car, he will go and find it, but actually he will take the money from you and he will keep the same ticket and he will use it for the next customer. Reuse it, yes. Yeah. Customer and for the next customer. So he was able to make in one month more than 50,000 dirham. But he was not doing the scheme alone. He was doing it with the other guys who are in the valet parking because all of them, they need to agree. But then they had a disagreement about who will, who will get how much. So they had the fight, and one of them decided to break the criminal code of ethics and went and reported them to management. That, so that's, that why, way. that's why there is a big percentage of uh, fraud discovered accidentally, not by the control system, not by the auditors or by CFE. Exactly. A lot and, of fraud can be discovered by accident, yes. And you know, you are speaking about a very important concept and one person is asking about it. They say, so as long as we disclose conflict of interest is okay. And exactly like what you said, what we call that in compliance, we call it a, 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 a sunshine policy. What's the meaning sunshine policy? As long as you disclose conflict of interest, as long as everything is under the sun is it clear, we have no problem, but yeah. you need to disclose your conflict yeah. of interest. Some people overcome this kind of control. They get the approval, but they do not renew the, pro uh, the approval. They get the approval for a special project, not for other projects, and they enter a new, new project. So this approval have to be renewed periodically uh, at least one, once a year. And the, the more frequent, I prefer more frequently. Okay, uh, one question, I don't know if this is related to the session, but they are saying uh, today, what can you see the new kind of fraud schemes happening that is different than the traditional fraud schemes that you know you mentioned? What are the, the new uh, tricks that fraudsters are using? Anything, any, related, any examples? To e anything related to e-banking. E-banking is the new fashion of fraud. Cyber security fraud, all frauds related to cyber security, cyber cyber uh, environment, is the new the new fraud. All right, we have our final question. They are saying, can you share with us, a, you know, interesting case that you handled related to any one of these schemes, and you know what was the outcome? You don't need to mention the details, but they just want to know, you know, any any case that you would like to share with them. Yeah, uh, the first time I become a manager. Uh, I read about the fraud schemes, uh, especially billing schemes. And then I know that we, we have, uh, I worked in a construction company in Saudi Arabia, and Saudi Arabia is a very big country. And uh, we, give a, we have a big fleet of cars given to the engineers and to, to the supervisors, etc. And so, so they use the company car and they, they fill the, their gas, the tank by gas and they bring invoice. Uh, I decided to collect all the invoices for a, a period of two to three months for a group of engineers who usually travel very long distance, uh, travel for all, most of the time. So I, grew, I collect all the invoices they brought to, to, to cash and I put them in order. I noticed some of the engineers, they use the same serial number from 1 to 50. You know, serial, the serial number of the invoices are 1 mm -hmm. to 50 always. So, and they submit the invoices, one, the day one, they submit invoice number 10. They, the day after invoice number one, the day after invoice number 40, the day after 20, so it's not in order. So the dates are not tally with the serial number. So this means that he have a complete set of book and he starts writing for him uh, invoices. So just put them in order, in order by serial number and compare the dates 
with the serial number. So when they did not match, I noticed that, uh, that there is something fishy and I noticed that later on that they used the same box. Yeah, I, I so using the serial number, looking at them by serial number, you can find this kind of scheme. I, I think technology is going to help us, all of us, to ensure that these processes are automated. But yes, the yes. only question, you know, are we going to keep our jobs if they are going to do all these analysis? Actually, actually, our job is threatened by the, uh, the, the new systems, the new programs, the new, a new era, new, uh, neuro-linguistic programming, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, there is a risk, big risk, because a lot of things, a lot of analytical procedures we use, we do, it can be uh, done through computer, like ACL, audit command language, etc. So uh, if we don't master this kind of uh, new systems, we'll be out of our jobs. Yes, I, I agree with you completely. I was looking at some of these recent tools and techniques and the amount of thinking that they have, they implemented and programmed this software to, uh, to uncover is massive. Like I was, I was looking at the software and I was learning from the software the schemes that I need to look at when I do it manually. I was like, wow, the software, they have so many features. So I was going feature by feature. So I will learn how to do it in the manual world, which is interesting. These guys, they are really on the cutting edge. Perfect. With that, I think it's the end of our session. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Ala, for you know, your amazing session. We are getting amazing feedback. They say this is you know very informative presentation, very interesting presentation. It's one of the best. It's you know, you covered so many areas. They feel they took like a you know a mini master degree with all the information that you have shared with them. And so I would like to really thank you for giving us, you know, your expertise and your time and your knowledge. And definitely, you know, if you are on social media, please uh, go and uh, follow uh, Mr. Ala uh, Abu Naba. He's, he's uh, actually uh, available on Twitter, uh, LinkedIn. He got so many WhatsApp group. You know, you will stay in contact with him and you will learn more from him. Thank you very much. And, uh, because of limited time, I did not give a lot of examples. I stick with my presentation. So later on, maybe we'll discuss more in more detail. Sure, definitely. We would love to have you with, with us yeah. again. Thank you very much for everything and for all the participants. All right. Thank you very much. And thank you all for joining us. I would like to thank all the ACAP chapters for supporting us. And, you know, this is the conclusion of our session.